Welcome to TJ Tabletop. I am TJ, your humble bard, here to tell you another tale from the dice table. And as I had said previously, there are precautionary tales that I want to tell you from my game, things that you should watch out for, little situations that will come up in your game eventually. Maybe you should think about how to handle them first. And this one revolves around cursed items, because DMs love cursed items. If you've never encountered one in D&D before, cursed item is basically a really strong enchantment that's going to have a really big setback. Or maybe not. You could get really lucky. If you roll really, really well on the dice, if you roll just exactly what you need to roll, uh, you could have an effect that's just non-existent or doesn't apply to you or, or just in one way or another will never impact you in any way whatsoever. You're basically just like off scot-free with this super powerful weapon. Or you can have something horrific happen to you. Now we have our half-orc uh, fighter, Gromeg, who started the game when he joined our campaign he already had a cursed item. He had a custom weapon, which was a scythe. And this was had to be like run by the DM and they had to figure out all the damage rules and all this because I don't think 5th edition has official rules for a scythe or sickle weapon. Like not the little like, not the little like uh, ninja type sickle. You know, I mean like the full like the Grim Reaper type, like that kind. Like I think we we're playing it as a glaive. I don't know, but whatever. It had to have its own rules, and he had to have this approved because it had, you know, a whole thing about it where it's like a piece of a god or something, and it's cursed. Basically, it boils down to the thing was cursed, and under certain conditions, he had to roll a constitution check to see if this thing took him over or not. Um, and that's all well and good. Um, except for the first time he did it, he lost control. Literally the first chance he had to lose control, he did. Now to this point, our, our, our fighter here had run up and joined our group because he found out that we had been in contact with the gods of this world. And by contact, I mean I shot one in the face with lightning. That's a pretty strong amount of contact. So he knew about this. He knew that we fought gods on our, you know, one of our big missions. So he had questions for a god. So he wanted to join up with us because he needed to talk to a god and we were the closest we were, he, he was going to get to that. Weird way to join. Okay, but, okay, fine. Keep in mind, if you'd watched some of my other videos, um, you will hear about the Rakshasa, and you will hear about uh, how we encountered that and how that became our big bad. Well, uh, at this point, uh, uh, we had encountered the Rakshasa once before, and we kind of knew it was going to come back and bite us at some point. We were going to see him again. So we're kind of always on the cautious end of, like, it's really weird this guy come out of nowhere and wants to join up with us, and he specifically knows what we've done. Like, um... Does he want an autograph? Like, I, like, like, I don't, I don't do that. Um, well, a photo op? Is it a photo? Op? Like, I, is there an Instagram in D and don't don't think so. Um, I, it was weird. So we were like really cautious. Like, this is like a Rakshasa thing. Is he like disguised as this guy? Is he joining? Because that's how our in character things would think. Like, we're gonna invite him along because we want him to join our party. Because you know he's a buddy. So like, he want we want him on the mission with us. So. Uh, we had we had to go off and handle our wizard's side story and literally the first fight we get into with this guy he fails the con save on his scythe and it takes over he basically starts berserking on who the closest person was who do you think the closest person was so the first swipe he takes with his scythe in the entire game and he goes for my head and uh, 
At this point, like now my character is like forced to think, oh God, he's an assassin. Oh God, this Rakshasa sent him. This is all a trap. Oh God. <laughs> Because that's literally what it seemed like. Because this thing just picked the most terrible time to actually manifest. So, I, it's, ironically enough, it's the only damage I took from that entire encounter was from my ally. It kind of became a running gag. It kind of became a running gag because before that we had a player, we had a warlock in the group, and every time that... Uh, every time Eldritch Blast crit failed, uh, the die to determine what direction it rolled in would always seem to roll in my direction. So it just became a joke of like any time someone in the party misfired anything, it was going to come at my head. Uh, not the best little quirk you want for your role-playing experience. So I tell you that to get to the part where uh, not only should you be cautious of cursed weapons, if you've actually had a cursed weapon go bad on you at some point, maybe don't double up. That is what Gromig did. See, we ran into a custom NPC boss, a frog king named, named King Kermius. Okay, my, my DM is very clever at coming up with cool D&D concepts, maybe the names, no, not so much. Uh, but he was part, he, like, he was like an emissary of our, like, big looming threat, the Tempest. And he was charged with, uh, I don't know, like, sowing some chaos in the world and had with him this magical boon, you know, which was in the shape of the, uh, I mean, tr the Trident of the Deep, I think was the name of it. But it's just this really magical trident that brings undead, certain like certain recently dead beings back to life. It returns to you after you throw it. It's a really powerful magical doodad. Our fighter wanted said magical doodad. So, um, we had an encounter with Kermius where... To our credit, Gromeg actually solved the fight without actually fighting. He tricked Kermius into looking into a magic mirror that he was carrying around, and it sucked him into this portal dimension inside the mirror when he looked into it. Okay, you know what? Cool. Uh, okay, G good job. Uh, handle the boss without actually fighting the boss. That's cool. He did it because he wanted the trident for himself. He was going to keep Kermius around until Kermius handed it over. Uh, I have to tell you that to get to this point, which is the part where we fight a phoenix. I you know, it's a weird little jump. It's like, Frog King, uh, Ancient Elemental. Okay, bit of a leap. But for whatever reason, we pick a fight with a phoenix that's flying overhead, because I guess we don't want any big elementals flying around the material plane. So we get done, we fight this phoenix, and... When you kill a phoenix in Dungeons and Dragons, it leaves its egg behind. And it's a big fireball when it goes off. Uh, Gromag nearly died. <laughs> like, he went unconscious from the blast of the fireball. So we heal him, and now we have a phoenix egg to deal with. Now, the, the egg is going to hatch in just so and so many days, whatever a dice roll from the DM says. So we don't want to have to deal with another phoenix running around the material plane. How do we deal with this? So idea comes to our head. We have the mirror. Uh, one of us, and that's going to be me because I have fire resistance, um, I'm going to take the egg and I'm going to carry it in and I'm going to look into the mirror and it's going to suck me and the egg in. And then I'm going to leave the egg behind and then I'll be let out of the mirror egg free. And this actually works. This actually lets us keep it in a little pocket dimension where even if it hatches, it's just trapped there. So no harm, no foul, everything fine until the arrow flew in. Uh, someone was watching us during this encounter, breaks the mirror with the arrow, and King, uh, the egg falls out. King Kermius falls out, head first into the phoenix egg. And he's a big, fat frog man with tiny little legs, and he's just like propped up on this egg, and he's just wailing, flailing around. He doesn't know what to do. He's just... He's in a bad way, so we're just, as we're trying, as he's screaming, and we're trying to discuss 
Do we even want to save him? Is it a useful thing to even save him at this point? He just dies. Uh, he just dies on us. <laughs> um, I don't know what to tell you. Like, we, he just got lobotomized on the edge of this egg. Uh, should be noted also at this point, when the egg comes back out, Grom Egg actually tries to attack the egg. The egg has fire feedback when you attack it. He went down again. <laughs> So this egg nearly ki has killed King Kermius and it nearly killed Grom Egg twice. This is the deadliest egg I have ever seen in my life. Um, but uh, we get him up again. But now he's all happy because Kermius is dead. There's the trident on the ground. So uh, we're dusting ourselves off. We're putting our stuff away because we've hit our usual four hour mark. It's time for everyone to head home. We got work and school and everything in the, in the morning. So... While we're packing up and everything, uh, and while we're like tabulating experience from the Phoenix, Gromig asks, like, since we're not doing anything, can I just attune to the Trident right now? Uh, that means rolling something for the curse, sure. Go, uh, but yeah, you spend an hour, uh, you know, uh, concentrating on this thing to uh, attune to it. Go ahead and roll. He rolls something ridiculous. And the next thing we hear is Gromeg, your time has come in this loud, booming, vo ominous voice as a portal opens up in front of him and this massive white behemoth of a human being comes through like bloody war axe in hand. He's just like, he's just bearing down on Gromeg, who I'll remind you, we already had to pick up from death twice. In the last five minutes. <laughs> um, and the session ended there. Is it like the most butt clench we've ever been? Because we knew, like, Gr this thing gunning for Gromig, and Gromig barely has any health whatsoever. And we, we're we all banged up, and our spell slots are expended because we fought a phoenix today, and uh, we don't have time. Oh, we're gonna die. Oh, this is it. TPK. We're all gonna die. Uh, I forget what the monster is. Um, and this is the same monster. I forgot what it was the last time I had to bring it up because uh, I told the story about how that one eventually got dealt with. But, um, yeah, it was way out of our league at the time. Now, the beginning of the next session, he hands over both cursed weapons in his possession and it leaves because the scythe, like, because of its curse, is just going to come back to him anyway. So he didn't mind that. So he lost his trident. He was trying to get so bad. But... Cautionary tale. Cursed items suck. They have great benefits. They come at great costs, and sometimes those costs may just kill the entire party. Because this thing very easily could have in other circumstances. So be careful with what you attune to, and for the love of God, do not attune to anything without a full rest. Do not do any attunement when you are weak and near death, just in case. So, that is my story for the day. I hope you enjoyed this cautionary tale of the cursed items. Um, I'm not sure what kind of story to tell next time, or if we're just going to chat about D&D a little bit. But whatever it is, I hope you join me. Until then.